Um, so we'll we'll just start just now. So thank you so much for joining us today, and happy National Friendship Week. Um, very exciting that it's finally here. We've been working up to it for like it feels like a year now that it's just been things that we're getting ready for it. But yeah, finally here, and it's great to be able to like share this knowledge and information with everyone. Um, so I just I'll, I'll go through a little bit about us. So and if. Many of you might already use Best Practice Network, but might, some of you might not be a bit like might not know who we are. So we've been a training provider since 2004, but we started doing apprenticeships in 2021. So fairly new to the to providing apprenticeships, but we've grown massively in that time to have probably about over 2000 apprenticeships on program at the moment through all our programs. So we we have three early years apprenticeship programs, the level two, the level three, and the lead practitioner level five. And then we also do five in schools as well, from TAs up to executive leadership. So yeah, massive, massive um development. Uh, last year we won um we won the education and child care apprenticeship provider of the year from, from the AAC awards, which was a massive achievement for us all, and the team were great, really excited about that and we're also a finalist for the same award this year for 2024 um which has just been great and a really big boost to the team um we also have tutors across the whole of england so local tutors we've really built that team up so we have you know we have tutors across the whole of england um which is it's just great to see it all grow um so today we're here to talk about the new early years educator program that we'll be launching from april so we, uh, our apprenticeship director, Tracy, was actually in the trailblazer for this. So we've had a really, a great head start to getting the program up and ready. We've been aware of all the modules, we've been aware of all the changes, and we're just ready to get going with it. So um, Emma Redding is joining us today. She's our curriculum manager for our apprenticeships. Um, and yeah, we're just, we've got, we've got the program ready. We're, we're started the the recruitment for it and we're just really excited to share with you the new changes and the new the upgrades for the for the um apprenticeship and um, so i'll go into a little bit um about today's session so it will be recorded um anybody who signs up you'll receive the recording and the slides that we're about to share um through email after the event um and then we'll also have the q a session um so we'll be able to answer ask, ask Ask any questions that you you would like. Um, we'll get to them either throughout or we'll um, answer them at the end as well. Um, and then and then yeah, so that's us. If I I'll pop over to Emma Reading, our curricular manager, and uh, she'll go through the program with you. Thank you. Thanks, Rebecca. Hi, everybody. Um, so as Rebecca said, I'm Emma, and I'm the curriculum manager for Best Practice Network. Um, so I've been close, um, been designing the early years educator level three apprenticeship um, for the newer version which we're launching in April. I'm really really excited about the newer version and excited to share with you today um, how the program looks. Um, Rebecca can you see my still see my screen okay? Perfect if you could just let me know if there's any problems moving on that'd be great sometimes you get issues with getting it moving on don't you so that's great and if you wouldn't mind monitoring questions and obviously I'll then dip it at the end as well. Perfect so um, just as um, just a quick sort of introduction and welcome, obviously Rebecca's covered most of this from her introduction, but um, just to sort of highlight what today's session's on really. So it's all about the revised early as educator level three apprenticeship. Um, as Rebecca mentioned, um, we've been as part of the Trailblazer group working to build this apprenticeship. Um, and so we've um, had a bit of a head start with, with building this. Uh, we are very excited about the changes and how they're gonna look and feel it's a, a much better program for supporting apprentices to become the best early as educators that they can be. So we hope you're as excited about the program as we are and definitely, hopefully by the end of this session, hopefully you'll be as excited as we are about it. Um, as Rebecca said, we offer various apprenticeships across schools and early years. Um, currently have over 950 apprentices on the EYE Level 3 and over 1,500 overall, um, with a high level pass rate, 51.9% um, and 48.1% receiving distinctions. We're aiming, obviously, with this newer programme, we're hoping that we're able to continue to build on that and to increase our high level pass rates and distinctions. Um, I will start by just going over a little bit just for anybody that is new to apprenticeships. Um, 
So just to explain what an apprenticeship is. Uh, so an apprenticeship is a learning programme that allows learners to learn while they earn, basically. So allows learners to be learning in the workplace. Um, so the majority of their, um, their learning is taking place when they're at work and they're given support from an apprenticeship tutor. Uh, so that's the basics of what an apprenticeship looks like. Um, apprenticeships are... Um, made up of various components which I'll go into more detail about the new EYE um, and how that's that's built up so um, there's a standard um, made up of knowledge skills and behaviors so the apprenticeship standard is designed to basically support the apprentice and develop their knowledge skills and behaviors that they need in their role um, there's maths and English functional skills which are part of an apprenticeship which I'll go over in a bit more detail in a second uh, something called off the job training, um, which I will explain for those that aren't familiar with this um, a li little bit later on in the slides. Um, there's something called gateway, which is a meeting where the learner, employer and um, training provider confirm that the learner is ready for endpoint assessment. Um, then there's an endpoint assessment that the learner goes through. Um, for those of you that are already familiar with the Early Years Educator Apprenticeship at the moment, the endpoint assessment has changed for this apprenticeship. So I'll go over that with you today and what that will now look like. Um, in addition to that, there are additional qualifications such as paediatric first aid, uh, which may be part of apprenticeships. And for Early Years Educator Level 3, um, I'll, I'll go over a bit more about what is now required within the additional qualifications. So I'll go into a bit more about our new version of the Early Years Educator Level 3. So this is coming into place from April 2024. Um, so our next group that will be enrolled will be enrolling onto the, the newer version, which we're very excited about. Uh, so we've designed the programme as a 15 month programme, um, which has a minimum of minimum duration of 12 months for a full time learner. Uh, the programme is um, extended for learners that are on part-time hours, so uh, the minimum duration will be extended for those that are working part-time. Um, but a typical learner would be sort of 12 to 15 months, um, and then a three-month EPA window that they've got to sit their endpoint assessment. Um, for those of you that are familiar with the current Early Years Educator Apprenticeship, one of the key changes that we've got with the new version of the programme is that there's no diploma. So this is, I think, a really good move. Um, and I'll, I'll just explain a bit more about what this means, really. Um, so at the moment, they um, apprentices will be completing a diploma um, where there's specific criteria and pieces of criteria that have to be met alongside working towards the apprenticeship standard. Um, for the new version, the diploma has been completely removed and there's no requirement that they have to complete a diploma. So it is purely assessing the learner on the knowledge, skills and behaviours of the apprenticeship. So this just removes that duplication, whereas previously they were having to work on a diploma and hitting these knowledge, skills and behaviours. Much more focus can be um, given to um, developing the apprentice in their role and developing them as an individual and to help them to be the best practitioner that they can be. So I think this would be a hugely positive change um, rather than just ticking a box. It's actually are they um, competent in those knowledge, skills and behaviours? And the apprenticeship provides that full professional recognition. So it's a full and relevant early years qualification without that diploma. So I think that will be hopefully a really positive change that will remove a lot of pressure for early years apprentices. Uh, apprentices will need to complete functional skills, maths and English level two, uh, as they currently do. So no changes to that. Um, I'm aware there has been obviously a change in the EYFS on the maths requirement, uh, but it is still an apprenticeship requirement. So any apprenticeship provider has to um, follow these requirements. So it's a requirement regardless of trained provider. Any provider needs to, um, to have those functional skills included. Um, Learners will also need to submit um, paediatric first aid certificates across. So learners will need to complete paediatric first aid as part of their apprenticeship and submit the certificate to us as part of that. And that certificate needs to be in date for Gateway. 
And the, um, the programme consists of 11 modules um, and endpoint assessment preparation. So with those 11 modules um, and then the endpoint assessment preparation, it allows learners to comfortably complete the programme within the 12 to 15 month period and gives plenty of time for them to prepare for endpoint assessment at the end of programme um, and throughout the programme as well. So it gives plenty of time for them to complete everything. Uh, I have included the link on the slides for the Institute of Apprenticeships, Institute for Apprenticeships, which um, gives the full apprenticeship standard and uh, that gives details of all the knowledge, skills and behaviours for the apprenticeship. So if you're interested in finding out a bit more and seeing a bit more about what apprentices will be learning from um, the programme and the knowledge, skills and behaviours and a bit more about the endpoint assessment after today, then the link is on the slides which we're sending out. Just... One question, if you don't mind answering it, yes. Naomi. Yeah, of course. Um, we've got Carrie who's asking, does this mean learners will have less written work to complete if they can demonstrate they have KSBs through observation and witness testimony? So is there less like written work? I know the within the modules we'll still have online tasks, but will there be less to do because of the diploma? Potentially, yes, because at the moment there is they are sort of even though there is some matching up between the the two, um, it's um, I think I think it will be much less pressure and because um, there's no set criteria other than the developing the knowledge, skills, and behaviours that they need to meet. Um, in terms of the program build, um, I've designed it to be quite flexible so that apprenticeship tutors can uh, talk to the learners about what they would prefer to do and how they prefer to do their assignments. So whether they prefer to do a written assignment or whether they prefer to do, say, a professional discussion or a mixture of both. Um, a lot of what we're designing and what I've been building into the programme as well is more work based and sort of project based evidence and things they can sort of prepare and carry out in their workplace and reflect on, uh, because this will be valuable evidence for them in endpoint assessment. So, for example, if they're demonstrating um, a project where they've planned and assessed um, a child or if planned for and assessed for a child's development or uh, supported a child through a transition and have got evidence to sort of back that up. Um, sort of that's that's how I'm designing the, the curriculum and the tasks, but I've written into the curriculum that flexibility. So some learners might end up doing quite a bit of written work if that's how they prefer to demonstrate their um, their knowledge aspects of the program, but it is much more flexible because there is less criteria that they need to meet. It's more about the KSBs. Fab. Um, we've got loads of questions coming in. There's some of them that I will maybe leave till a bit later on, but there's one from Jacqueline. Do we still need GSE maths? Um, so if you have a GCSE or of a C or above, um, for maths and English before starting the programme, you won't have to do the functional skills. That's the, the criteria of requirements met. But if you don't, then that's when you would do functional skills level two on programme for English and maths. Um, and we have functional skills tutors that will help you through and they're re like additional to our friendship tutors. So really extra support for that, for gaining those qualifications. Um, so if you already have GCSE maths, then you won't have to do functional skills. But if you don't, then you can achieve your functional skills level two on program. Hopefully that's that's answered those ones. Um, yeah, have you got any or have you got any more questions? Um, I'll leave it there. Someone someone yeah. asked about the modules, so that's that's definitely coming up in the yes. in the slides. We'll continue in the slides and we'll get back to the questions. But thanks yeah. for that. Yeah, hopefully some of the questions will, will be answered as we go. So. Um, I was just going to do before I go into a bit more about what the modules are, um, I was going to go into a few of the benefits of the new programme. Um, so as I've mentioned, the lack of diploma, I think, allows for much more focus to be given on developing the apprentice as an individual rather than having to tick off and just meet criteria. It's, it's more about developing that apprentice as an individual and supporting them to learn in a way that's best for them as well, uh, because obviously the goal is for them to achieve as high as they can at endpoint assessment and to become the best practitioner that they can be and to develop them as an individual. So there can be much more focus given for that now, which is how our how, what we've reflected then in, in our curriculum and how we've designed the tasks and uh, the modules. There are very clear links between the knowledge and the skills, um, so more so than with the previous programme. 
Um, I've actually got some slides that will demonstrate that a little bit later on, but you'll see that there's a very clear link. So what they're learning in knowledge, they're able to build on that, apply and demonstrate in practice. And there's that very clear link. Uh, the endpoint assessment methods allow learners to demonstrate their abilities in their role much more effectively. So they have removed the multiple choice question test in place of an observation, which I think is a huge benefit. Um, whereas previously you may get learners that aren't necessarily very good at exams, but are amazing practitioners and who potentially might misread a safeguarding question and get that question incorrect with the new programme. Um, it's not about being able to pass a test. It's about how they are in practice. So there's now an observation that replaces that test. So I think that will be a huge benefit in being able to assess the actual capabilities of learners in their workplace and what they actually do best. Uh, there is also now the opportunity to achieve a merit grade. So with our previous program, it was either pass or distinction. With the new program, they can achieve um, a pass, a merit or a distinction. Um, the merit grade would be if they get a distinction in the observation, um, but then a pass in their professional discussion. So that's the way around. It's only, it only goes that way around, but it means that those that are outstanding in the, their practice and show that in their practice can achieve that merit grade. So it gives them a nice sort of in-between grade. Um, other benefits. Um, so it's given us a real opportunity to really consider and think out our programme, make sure it's clear, well sequenced and up to date. So we've made sure that it's in a logical order um, for a, a typical apprentice that's starting in early years from the, for the very first time. Uh, the webinar sessions that um, we'd, we've designed allow learners to share practice and ideas with learners in different settings. Um, we've designed our curriculum to be very interactive and allowing lots of opportunities for those discussions and activities. Um, so that should allow learners to be able to share practice and ideas with learners in different types of setting. And there's plenty of opportunities in the curriculum for revisiting and building on knowledge. So we have regular practice discussions, for example, um, added stretch and challenge. So there's opportunities for the tutor to question and stretch the learner even further, but also suggested activities they can do to stretch themselves further and particularly to stretch to a higher grade um, if they're aiming for a distinction, for example, or to support their career goals as well. So lots of benefits um, that I can see for the, the new programme. Uh, hopefully, um, hopefully you can, you'll all agree with the benefits that it, you know it sounds like a, a much more relevant program for apprentices so just a little bit about our delivery plan um, it's a blended program of face-to-face -face and online study so similar to how we deliver now um, learners will have online independent modules that they can complete um, so something called SCORM packages where they have online interactive modules to complete um, they will also have one-to-one um, -one visits with their apprenticeship tutor and then they can also um, as part of their off-the-job training um, we offer um, webinar sessions as I've mentioned so group webinars as well so there's lots of different ways that apprentices can learn we have progress reviews every six weeks um, so we we try and complete these um, every four to six weeks um, to make sure that apprentices are given the best support that they can be given um, specialist one-to-one -one tutor support and that also includes functional skills support if needed um, so for maths and English um, we've got a programme which we've recently launched, um, which some of you may be aware of already, but a new programme we've launched, which is our personal development, career information, advice and guidance and welfare programme, which is called BPN Boost. All learners have access to this through their apprenticeship, um, regardless of what apprenticeship they're on with us, all learners have access. And this involves um, monthly webinars on different topics, things like mental health and well-being, British values, employability. So we have these monthly webinars running, but there's also a library of resources that learners can access independently. We also encourage regular reflections on learning and practice and a partnership between um, BPN, the apprentice and the employer. So obviously uh, there needs to be a strong partnership between all three parties. Um, so that's the basics of our delivery model, really. Rebecca, do you have any more questions you wanted me, on, me to answer before I move on? Yeah, we have we have a couple. Um, so, uh, 
Mila wants to know a little bit more about KSBs and what it stands for. So kind of more like on the apprenticeship level, I think it'd be good to kind of talk through. Um, so they stand for knowledge, skills and behaviour. Emma, do you want to, are you, are you going yeah. to talk more about that a bit later on? Yeah, actually, so I've got um, some slides that show how the knowledge, skills and behaviours sort of link together. So I'll go through those. And then if you've got any more questions, feel free to um, pop another answer in the Q&A. But I, I think that should answer that one quite nicely. Yeah. Hopefully, so. Um, and do all, Sophie's asking, do all apprentices receive um, additional learning support from functional tutors? And does this include both one to one and group training? So all learners have access to um, the group webinars that we offer. Um, our um, support that apprentices are offered is individualised to what their needs are, basically. So this is something that is reviewed at the very beginning of the programme. And uh, depending on the learner's results on their diagnostics that they complete and discussions with their tutor, a, um, a pathway is agreed of what level of support that they require, basically. Um, and that require, that involves different things such as independent learning on BKSB, which is the online platform. Um, it includes group webinars and attending group webinars um, with other learners. And it also, attend, um, also involves the one-to-one -one sessions. So it's looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. So it's not that every learner automatically gets that. It's, it's based on needs. Um, so we make sure that we give the right support for every apprentice. Yeah, and I do know with the functional skills tutors, they do like evening sessions as well, like drop-in sessions, which are becoming a little bit more popular. So we've we've basically included functional skills tutors for maybe about six months, I would say. And yeah, the the way that they're working and things like that are is being developed and these kind of like after like evening sessions, drop-ins are 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 providing, you know, a different set of um support for just the functional skills. Um Fab, I think we'll I'll, I'll come, we'll come back to a few of those questions afterwards as well. But if we will continue just for now for the yes. for the students, thank okay. you. So I just very quickly wanted to share our curriculum intent because I just think it's useful for you to see what we're trying to achieve through our curriculum. Um, but we are really aiming to address the recruitment crisis by supporting you to develop the um the most skilled early years educators that we can basically. So um, it's aimed at learners in a range of different early years settings, either new to the sector or upskilling. Um, and as I've said there, I've just um, put some of the apprenticeship behaviours and what, what we're trying to achieve really in that. So supporting apprentices to develop into skilled, caring and compassionate early years educators who show a commitment to their role with children and families. Um, I've mentioned, you know, we, we really want to stretch and challenge every apprentice, support them to achieve their full potential and their career goals. Um, but see, it's also meets the ratio requirements and the um, the qualification requirements within the YFS. Um, and we are also really aiming to support and develop apprentices' confidence, allow them to share ideas and give them those that key bits of information on key topics. So I know somebody asked about the curriculum modules, so I'll show you what those modules look like. So just make those appear on the screen. So um, personal development um, is um, sort of the, where we, we typically start. So personal development, safeguarding, health and safety, these topics have been planned in nearer the start of programme for a typical learner that's following the programme through in a typical order. Uh, we allow flexibility with our programme. So we have recently started this with the, the previous version of the apprenticeship and we'll be continuing with this. Um, so learners and employers can work with the apprenticeship tutors and identify and, and book webinars that suit them at set times. So for a learner who isn't really sure and just wants to follow it through, they can follow it through in this suggested order. Um, but we work with you really and with the apprentice. So if, for example, there's a particular need, um, let's say that you identified that you wanted the, the learner to know more about teaching, learning and assessment early on, for example, that's something that would be discussed in the review. And then that webinar would be booked um, earlier on. So it's very flexible to make sure that it's individualized for each apprentice's needs. Uh, but yeah, we've we've considered how to design the programme in that logical order for a typical learner, but then allowing for that little bit of flexibility as well. Uh, throughout the programme, we have um, recap and recall practice discussions. Um, so whatever order they complete the modules in, they'll be 
continuously revisited and safeguarding and areas like safeguarding health and safety, for example, um, are embedded into the full program. So even from the very beginning, so their first day of learning, they start learning about safeguarding personal development and talking about the role of um, an early years educator. There's some areas on whistleblowing and safeguarding, and it's basically embedded into everything that's covered as well. And we try and just make sure that everything's as, as logical and clear as possible. Um, and then there is a webinar at the end for preparation for endpoint assessment. And this allows apprentices to not only recap on key topics, but also to um, discuss, prepare, and get some sort of key hints and tips as well, because I know it's, it's nerve wracking for apprentices sometimes not knowing what to expect, um, preparing for the, the endpoint assessment. So um, gives the opportunity to discuss with other other apprentices, get some tips from um, a tutor and to have that additional session to prepare themselves. So this next slide just um, gives a little bit more of an example. Um, this was where I was looking to demonstrate the links, clear links between the knowledge and skills. So you'll see here, um, this is some examples of our safeguarding and health and safety modules, for example, um, and the knowledge and skills that these modules cover. So you see we've got um, the knowledge on the left and then on the right, the skills, and you can see that the knowledge and skills really closely link. Um, so the apprentices would be assessed in their knowledge from the the tutor, um, whether that's by completing written work or a professional discussion, um, then the skills would be covered in practice and apprentices can use a combination of being observed in the workplace, submitting work products and documents from their setting, witness testimonies and so on. So that's sort of how they will then cover those skills as well. And everything sort of links together very well, basically. So um, so that it doesn't feel like then there's that, that duplication, all these kind of different aspects can then be pulled together to, to meet the knowledge and skills. Um, I'll show just that there's another one here as an example. Um, they do really nicely link together um, very closely. Um, in terms of behaviours, uh, there are eight behaviours in the apprenticeship, which we embed throughout everything in our curriculum. So in our webinar sessions, for example, these are the sorts of things that are con um, continuously discussed throughout. Um, these are the behaviours that apprenticeship tutors will be supporting on a one to one basis and giving apprentices feedback on as well when they observe them or through discussions, but also to be supported by employers and for apprentices to just be able to generally genuinely um, to um, demonstrate these behaviours in their day to day role, basically. So um, the behaviours are, are basically embedded throughout everything the apprentice is doing. Hopefully that's answered the question on the knowledge, skills and behaviours, but please let me know if there's anything additional on that one. Is there anything else um, in the in the Q&A that would be good to answer now, Rebecca, before I move on? Um, so there's a few there's a few ones about functional skills again, really. Um, yeah. Uh, which is probably a good good before we move on to EPA and, and things like that yeah. to talk about functional skills. Okay. So, um, do, 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 sorry, <laughs> find all the questions. <laughs> so, um, another one about, uh, can you explain what further why math has been included and what is not a requirement of EYFS? Um, yeah, this, about how difficult the maths um, has been to pass and um, yeah, if it's not necessary, then why is it, why is it included? So like, yeah, it's it's not a requirement in the EYFS, um, but the EYFS has nothing to do with the apprenticeship requirements. So it's unfortunately it's out of our hands and out of any apprenticeship provider's hands in that any apprenticeship provider that's providing an apprenticeship has to include the functional skills, maths and English. So there is no apprenticeship that you'll find in any topic Um that that doesn't include those functional skills, I don't believe. Um, it's it comes from the government basically, um, and their their aim to upskill in functional skills, maths and English. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, it's um, it's out of our hands in um in that decision. Um, but what we can do is we provide all of the support 
that we can to get learners through. So that's why we've got such a flexible program in being able to give the one to one support where needed, the group webinars, the independent learning that apprentices can do. We try and just make sure that we give all the support from the very beginning. Um, and I know it's, it's quite a difficult topic for some apprentices. A lot of people fear maths, don't they? So, you know, is it? a scary prospect I think for some apprentices in the beginning which is why we approach it with um sort of sensitivity really and um, and make sure that we provide all the support that apprentices can, can be given really from the very beginning yeah thanks Emma and I know the rules have changed now about managers is that from yes. from this yeah. year to become a manager you have to have functional skills level two so do we aim to for the level three to progress on to the lead practitioner and if they can't ha if they can't become a manager because they don't have those functional skills, then it sort of cuts their their progression route in their their career. So it's a great opportunity to do that on program while they have support and then they can progress up to the level five and you know become a manager if that's what they yeah. want to do. Absolutely. And I know yeah. it was something that Tracy did try and speak about in the Trailblazer, but yeah, the the government just didn't budge on that on no. the math section of it. So yeah. What we do try and um, include throughout our um, webinar sessions is we try and provide some contextualised maths learning, maths and English learning, both really, but in particular with the maths, we try and contextualise and provide just small little chunks of maths learning in an early years context. And that can, we find that that supports apprentices to see the relevance to that in their role and actually that there is maths that they are doing um, and to support their Kind of confidence within that subject in just a, a small way just bite-sized little chunks and just embedding it throughout as well but yeah i think it, it as rebecca says it also does provide the support for their career development if they did want to progress further as well yeah and then from jacqueline how long does the functional skills program for math take um it's very relevant to her team so it's case by case basis i think it depends so the the functional skills is done within the apprentice's own time, so that is not included in the off-the-job training that they do. Um, if if they achieve it relatively quickly, then they do they won't be able to go through to the EPA before completing maths and English. But there's no time limit. Um, it's really up to the apprentice and how they get on with the with the learning. So we're not we're not rushing anyone through that. You know, there's there's plenty of opportunities to reset until they do achieve it um, and the support's there. So until that's kind of um, achieved, then they, you know, then they go on to gateway and make sure that that's all in place before before the endpoint assessment. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we just make sure that we get them started with it and identify the support that they need from the very beginning, because what we don't want is for them to put it off and then not be able to achieve it for, say, however many months we want them to, if they need to reset, that they have that opportunity to, to do that and plenty of time to do it. So we just need to make sure that they're given the opportunity to start on it early on and not hide from it, basically. Yeah, fab. Um, amazing. So Jacqueline's just said, so you can take an apprentice, apprenticeship at the same time, not after they've achieved it. Yeah, so it's done at the same time as the apprenticeship. So it's a, alongside it. Um, yeah. So to to them to go into endpoint assessment, they have to have achieved their functional skills in maths and English. Yes, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's that's um answered that one. Thanks, Jacqueline. Um, Fab, we'll, we'll continue on and oh, we'll yeah. get that question soon. So I have touched on these assessment methods for endpoint assessment, but just to give a bit more detail about what endpoint assessment looks like with the new program. So the first assessment method, as I've mentioned, is an observation with questioning, which replaces the old multiple choice question test. Uh, this is in the workplace and um, is one hour and 20 minutes assessment in total. So it's 50 minutes of, of observation plus a 30 minute questioning session at the end. Uh, so the second method is a professional discussion underpinned by a portfolio of evidence. Um, so this is in the workplace or by video conferencing. Uh, it's a 90 minute discussion, um, minimum of 10 questions and the um, endpoint assessor may then also ask follow up questions as well. So the apprentice needs to be prepared to somewhat lead that discussion. Um, the, um, the endpoint assessor will ask questions, but they'll need to be able to talk at length, basically. 
Um, this is the same as we currently have um, the assessment method too. So they are currently doing that already. Uh, so the main big difference is the observation with questioning, which as I've mentioned, I think is a much more effective assessment method. Um, our curriculum is designed to provide um, mock assessments and opportunities for regular observation and regular professional discussion, uh, just to make sure that the apprentice is confident to be observed. Um, so to make sure that they're prepared and understand how to plan for that observation and how to prepare. Um, and we make sure that the first observation is done within the first eight weeks of programme um, at the very latest eight weeks so that um, apprentices are then able to be given feedback from the very beginning and can then build on any areas that they need to improve on and can also sort of identify their own strengths as well. So I was just going to go over a little bit on some of the requirements, um, just for those that aren't aware of what the requirements are um, from an employer for an apprentice on programme. So the requirements are to, first of all, attend learner reviews and to, to sort of contribute and get involved in the learner reviews with the um, apprenticeship tutor. Uh, so this is in order for all three um, parties, so the tutor, the employer and the apprentice, to all be able to work together and support the apprentice to develop in the best way that they can. Uh, to allow apprentices time to attend monthly webinars. Uh, so our webinars are planned with usually a morning and afternoon session available for the same topic. We avoid lunch times. Um, so at the moment, our sessions are 10 till 12 and 2 till 4. We are looking at offering a little bit more variety in those times as well, potentially. Um, but we, we avoid those sort of key lunchtime hours um, and usually try and keep it sort of more to the um, those times in, after sort of drop off and before pickups and avoiding lunches. Uh, to uh, provi provide apprentices as well with um, six hours of off-the-job training per week for a full-time apprentice or 20% off-the-job training for a part-time apprentice. I've got a slide on that next, so I'll just give just a, a little bit of more of an explanation for those that aren't aware of what that is. Uh, to provide apprentices with a mentor um, and, or somebody to be responsible for the apprentice and support their learning to provide regular support, feedback and guidance to make sure the apprentice is fully supported in the workplace and to provide apprentices with opportunities to develop those knowledge, skills and behaviours. Um, that would include if there's any um, any areas, for example, the apprentice yet ha hasn't yet had the opportunity to develop in, um, identifying those opportunities where they can learn more about any areas relevant to the apprenticeship. I'll just go over a bit more about off the job training. So off the job training is a requirement of any apprenticeship, um, which involves uh, basically six hours per week, as I mentioned, for a full time apprentice or 20 percent for a part time apprentice um, should be spent uh, basically on learning that's relevant towards the apprenticeship. So from the term off the job training, sometimes the first thing people think of is off the job, being out of the room, having time out for completing assignments and things. Um, it's not necessarily just that. It's basically any learning which is relevant to the apprenticeship and is developing new knowledge, skills and behaviours. So you can see some examples on the screen include things like coaching and mentoring, um, opportunities for reflective practice and learning, shadowing um, and attending sort of training and events, um, interactive online learning. So it, it can include obviously the online learning through us or any online learning that they're doing through you as well, um, completing research projects. Uh, so it's, it's quite wide, really. It's basically as long as it's within their working hours, um, it's developing new knowledge, skills and behaviours, and it's relevant to their apprenticeship standard, um, then it, it can be counted um, not to include maths and English. So I think, as Rebecca mentioned earlier on, maths and English is funded separately. So it, it's, it's basically anything that is relevant to their early years apprenticeship. Um, so that can include things as well, like first aid training and, and courses training that you're getting them to do that is relevant to their apprenticeship. So just um, a little bit about the funding. 
Um, so the funding for the early years educator is for the, the newer version, uh, the total funding is £7,000. Um, obviously within that, um, the maximum for, so for a, um, a business that's not paying into the apprenticeship levy, the maximum that you would need to pay is £350. Um, this can also be spread across the um, the duration of the apprenticeship. So it wouldn't necessarily be £350 in one go. Um, it can be spread across the, uh, the duration of the apprenticeship. Um, I've got some bits just here on the slide. So if you're not that familiar with um, apprenticeships on the different kind of funding options. So if your setting does contribute to the apprenticeship levy fund, then the um, the funding will be fully accessible through um through the levy um if not as i've said it's it's the five percent contribution so that would be maximum 350 pounds um there is also um additional incentives so if your setting has fewer than 50 employees um it's a fully funded apprenticeship for those that are 16 to 18 or 19 to 24 with the education and healthcare plan um, and you will also receive an additional £1,000 incentive for 16 to 18 apprentices as well. Uh, so I will, um, we will make sure these slides are sent across um, and we can support with any further information on funding and accessing the funding and the apprenticeship um, account as well. So. so just to go over before we answer questions at the end, just going over next steps on applications. Sorry, I realised I've not moved the slide on. There we go. Uh, so applications for apprentices that are wanting to apply, um, applications can be made through our website and we're now taking applications for the new apprenticeship. Um, the deadline is 17th of March for an April start and we will be running monthly cohorts. Um, so we've closed the deadline currently for our February cohort, which are starting this month. Um, we, due to the switchover, we're not running a March cohort. So the next cohort following the February one is for the April start. Um, I've included links on here about um, how you can recruit apprentices for your settings. So we've got the form that takes you to um, a vacancy form. So if you needed support with recruitment and recruiting an apprentice, then you can fill in this form here on the screen um, and um, complete it in as much detail as possible. And we can support with um, recruiting an apprentice. Um, and there's also a link here. If you've got a vacancy for a new role, then we can um, contact you to support with the vacancy. So our sales team will be able to support you by advertising on our website. Um, and on the government's find an apprenticeship site as well. So we've just got those links on the screen, which um, we'll send out with the slides. Um, and just to give you the key dates of what's happening next. Um, so our applications have opened for April starts for the new apprenticeship. Um, the application deadline is the 17th of March. And the first day of learning is planned for the 24th of April. Um, we may be, depending on the number of applicants we have, we may be offering more than one date, but at the moment that's the one date that we've got, so April 24th for the first day of learning. Um, so that's really everything that I wanted to go over, um, so I'm happy now to just answer any of the questions that we've got in the, the chat, so please put any additional questions that you have in the Q&A. Thank you so much, Emma, for going through that. It was yeah, really informative and we've had so many questions and it's thanks so much for engaging everyone in this new programme. And um, so I'll just start from, start from what we've got. I've been answering them as they go along. If I have, if I've answered yours and you have any more questions about it, just pop it back in. But we'll start with Peter. Um, so he's asking about the paediatric first aid. Um, is this something we do through BPN or is it something that needs to be arranged by the employer? We don't deliver it, um, so it, it needs to be arranged through the employer. Um, I believe um, I don't have much to do with the funding. I believe that we um, that it is figured out around around that um, based on on whether it's required or not, and there's a reduction. Um, but it needs to be arranged and completed, and the certificate submitted by. Um, by the time that the learner is in gateway and that certificate needs to be in date for when they're in gateway. I'm guessing if we if they had any questions, the apprenticeship team will be able to support them in finding the right, you know, 
the right um, business to do the, the first aid and how to get you know the support from us from to do it and things like that so yeah yeah exactly um can you guarantee that the new um apprenticeship will definitely meet the full dfe full and relevant criteria and appear on their spreadsheet yeah it's it's absolutely a, a full and relevant um qualification so that yeah there's absolutely no concerns with that it's absolutely full and relevant yeah um on that when you get the slides the little ify um link from there it has all the details about the new standard and it does mention on there that it's full and relevant so yeah we're we're very much guarantee that that's that's the case Amazing. Uh, Sophie's just asking, um, will the programme assessors be completing face-to-face -face visits to the nurseries to provide the opportunity to practice being observed and to check skills? So you've got um, EPA assessment, but the programme assessor, that's our, our I guess, you're meaning the apprenticeship tutors. Yeah, so, um, yeah, absolutely. So that they'll be carrying out um, those regular observations throughout, um, which is important for not only endpoint assessment preparation, but also supporting them to develop and understand how they can develop um, their knowledge and skills and behaviours as well, so. Fab, thanks for going through that one. So I've got another one from Anonymous, but um, so the thinking behind the minimum time frames, um, why can't a part-time staff who has more time not complete the course quicker, uh, so longer period of time for them doesn't make sense. So, yeah. The minimum time frame is set by apprenticeship standards. So the the minimum is that's that's how you can't you can't go on to EPA in any less than twelve months in one day. That is the minimum amount of time that they give that you have to do. Um, because it's an you know in work off the job hour program, so you have to be employed. You can only complete the off the job hours in in your employment time. So if you a part time member of staff works you know, six hours a week, their off the job training would be 20% of that. So they wouldn't be allowed to do any more training uh, than than that allotted time. So that's why the program takes longer. Um, I think we we had a question a bit earlier about like, if they, you know, if uh, on the other side, if they do want to take longer, is there an option for that? And yes, we won't, we won't make anybody go through endpoint assessment until they're completely ready. So the minimum term, you can't do it any quicker than 12 months in one day. We we're giving about 15 months if you're if you're full time. If you're part time, it will take longer. But we can go through that um individually, case by case, when we when we have apprentices. And if there's an apprentice that's really proactive and, and does want to finish quicker, you know, you know, that 12 months in one day is is the quickest they can they can do it. Amazing there. So if they were to do get the diploma diploma to do the maths aspect but not as an apprenticeship is sorry I'm <laughs> reading this one through if they were to do the diploma alone they wouldn't have to do the maths aspect but not as an apprenticeship yeah so, so, um, yeah. so there may be um, providers that may offer for example a standalone diploma but these are funded differently so this might be that the, the, sorry, the apprentice the staff member for example might take out a um, a loan for example so advanced learn loan or there might be other options they can do if it's a diploma that they're after and that would not then need the functional skills because it's not an apprenticeship so it doesn't have the same requirements obviously then it's it's down to that staff member deciding that's what they want to do and, and funding it themselves um, and obviously they then it is it's different to apprenticeship in my opinion obviously then they don't get the benefits of the apprenticeship and the the support that goes with with that as well and um the, the benefits of that but um that is an option they can do um it's it's not something that we offer at the moment obviously we are an apprenticeship provider it might be something that we go down the route of at some point um but yeah i obviously i would encourage um personally encourage the apprenticeships um due to the the way that it's funded and the um just the the benefits of the support that they get from an apprenticeship yeah totally agree thanks emma um how long do the functional skills maths take i think we've covered this but there isn't a specific time frame it's just how so we we kind of evaluate the learner when they come on program is the program's called bksb is it is that yeah. correct emma? yeah yeah They'll do a bit of an assessment to see where they're at with their English and maths. And then that that kind of provides like a 
kind of outline on on what they've got to achieve and and how it kind of tailors the course to them as well so if they learn better through different you know um i guess different aspects or if they you know if they're more of like a you know like they have to study and read things or if they're more like bite-sized pieces of information that program kind of tailors how they should learn it um it could you could get it done in six months it could take the full year but it's really um you know, down to each individual learner, but we won't go through to EPA until that's done. So there's no, we don't give a time limit on it. Uh, fabulous. Um, if a learner continually fails math, but has completed their level three, um, can they drop their apprenticeship and still be level three qualified? So this is the difference, Nicolette, is the, the full and relevant um, qualification is now attached to the apprenticeship. So, they, there's no diploma there's you wouldn't be able to just do that and then also receive a level three you they'd have to do the full apprenticeship successfully go through endpoint assessment receive a grade and then that's what gives them the the full and relevant qualification so um, um, in addition to that i'll just add that um it, it is important as a result for us to make sure that when apprentices are um, doing their initial assessments at the very beginning, that they are done by that apprentice, that they're not given any support and that those initial assessments are an accurate reflection of their abilities, um, just because obviously we don't want anybody to be set up to fail and then not be able to achieve. But we 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 don't just, you know, we, we wouldn't just get to a point where we would take someone off programme. You know, we no matter how many attempts it takes, we'll, we're committed to supporting that apprentice and giving them all the support that they need. And as long as they've done their initial assessments by themselves and from the beginning, then we assess that they should be able to achieve. So there, there shouldn't really be any problems with that. Yeah. And um, I know there was a question I did start typing an answer to, but I'll, I'll answer it on, on here instead. Um, if anybody signed now would automatically go on to the new version. So if somebody's already in the process and has applied and is being enrolled in February, they'll be on the current version. Anybody that applies now that starts in April will go automatically onto the new version because the new version is um, approved and starting officially from April. Um, so any apprentices that um, that you wanted to be on the newer version, I would make sure that they get onto the, the April cohort. Yeah, and I believe if they have already applied for the February, I think well, we're quite late on to enrolment, but if they did want to um defer and start in April if, if you if you as a business can can um make that work and if you wanted to do the new program then you can but so everyone who's applying right now will go on to the the newest version which is the one we're talking about today there's a few about funding and ages and things like that so we could probably answer these ones sort of in one but um there isn't a maximum age for the apprenticeship um so um I think that the ages that you saw probably on the the one looking at funding and obviously I'd mentioned some of the ages 19 to 24 for example and and that was to do with sort of having it fully funded for those that have a education and healthcare plan um but any one of any age can complete an apprenticeship um so there's, there's not a maximum age for funding um with eligibility um they need to be so they can have a, a higher level qualification as well you know they could be potentially qualified to higher than a level three, but they can't have that in um, or equivalent in early years, basically, because then there'd be it would affect the funding because they wouldn't be identified as needing the, to develop those knowledge, skills and behaviours. So that would be the the main thing to, to look at for potentially somebody that's um, a little bit older, you know, what their education is already and if they have anything equivalent in um, early years. Um, but no, there's there's not a maximum age. And the um, the minimum age would be so from 16 so um can apply for for starting for a 16 year old what company carries out the endpoint assessment itself so we use um an endpoint assessment organization called nipa can you remember rebecca what that stands for oh <laughs> Put me on the spot. <laughs> also, <laughs> acronyms in education. Yeah. Um, I think it's just, is it national endpoint assessment? Let me just look it up. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I'll come back to you on that one. <laughs> I'm just looking up to um Yeah, yeah. but it's, a, it's an outside organization that we use. Yeah, yeah, so it's it's an external organization. Yeah. Um is it all early years apprenticeships that are going to be like this without without no without the diploma or just PPNs? Um yeah, so this is the new standard for the early years educator level three. So this is across the board, any apprenticeship provider that that provides the early years educator level three will have to you know go by this new standard so it's not that we're just changing it and no one else is it's 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 the i fate have changed the standard so everyone will be going on to this this new style however the modules and things that's what we've designed and what emma has designed so the the, the curriculum will follow on from the ksbs but emma's designed this this apprenticeship um with all the modules that that link up to all the ksbs but that it's across the board that the diploma is gone, basically. Um, just looking through a few of the questions. Um, would this still come out of levy funding? So therefore, still funded. So yes, this is the apprenticeship. It will still come out of the levy funding. If if you pay into the levy, it will be one hundred percent funded. If you don't pay into the levy. It will be ninety five percent funded by the government, and then five percent funded by a co investment from the employer. Um, so that's still exactly the same as it was before. Um, I think that is all our questions for now. Does anybody else have any? Uh, so sorry for for age eighteen plus still funded. Um. Yes, so depending on if you pay into the levy or if you don't, it will be either 100% funded or 95% funded. Um, if you do want to, if you do need any more advice on the funding or want to speak to us, we've we've always got advisors that are happy to help and we will take you through the whole funding process to setting up your account, to giving us permission to um, to receive the funding. We will help from the beginning. So. I don't see it as like a a barrier, if that makes sense. Or we've got a massive team that are there to help. So um, you can either get in touch with inquiries at best practice net. I'm writing it as I'm typing. Uh, .co.uk or apprenticeships at, um, and they'll be able to help with any questions you have with funding or the program or anything to do with that. Just to answer the question about the company, <laughs> just in case you're interested. So it NEPA stands for National Endpoint Assessment, which I think is what you said, Rebecca. <laughs> Great, yes. <laughs> um, so I saw something about 100% incentive for 16 to 18 year olds. Yes. So if you if your apprentice is between 16 and 18, then you the employer receives a thousand pound incentive as well as if they're 19 to 24 on a, uh, what's the the plan called? The education and healthcare plan. Okay. Yeah. So the, the employer receives the 1,000 pound um, incentive. I'll just go back to the funding slide. It might be useful to look at. Yeah, so it's it's on the bottom of this slide here. So for it's, it's for settings that have fewer than 50 employees um, and there's the 1,000 pound incentive for um, the 16 to 18s and the um the fully funded apprenticeship for 16 to 18 or 19 to 24 with education healthcare plan. Amazing. So Jasmine asking, are overseas workers entitled to funding? So you have to have lived in the UK for the, the past three years um to to as a as a requirement to go on to the, the apprenticeship. So um, and then that's how you would get the funding. So you wouldn't be able to do the apprenticeship without the funding. And to to a requirement for that is you've got to be you've got to have lived in the UK for the last three years. Answer that one. Um, oh yeah. So Sophie's mentioned as well uh, levy transfers, which are um, when larger companies who do pay into the levy uh, pot, if they don't use up all their funds, they can transfer. Um, 25% of their funds to smaller businesses to do their friendship. So it could potentially be fully funded if you go down that route. And we can support you as well looking for levy transfers. So if you do 
If you say that you would like to fund it through Levy Transfer, then our friendship team will help you find, or you might already know a company that are willing to to um trans to gift these to call it Levy gifting as well. Um, they are put over to you. So something as well that we can that we can support. Sorry, I accidentally ticked one off as done there, but just to confirm the recording will be sent out. So don't worry if you've missed the start, the recording will be sent out after. So does the employer need to register with BPM before accepting an apprentice or do they need to authorise the application? So um, for an apprentice, if they, are, if they want to do an apprenticeship, the first thing they would say is talk to the employer because you have to have the consent of the employer because they are the you know, they're the ones paying or, fund. you know, with the funding goes through the employer. So make sure that you have full consent from your employer before uh, applying. Then the, then you would apply through our website. And from that, we would send an employer form to your employer and they would, they would fill out some information for us and we would talk to yourself and the employer. So it's really a partnership between Best Practice Network, the employer and the apprentice. But you need their full consent before applying, basically. So get get consent, apply for the apprenticeship, and then we'll send all the relevant information that we need from like to the employer and, and ask them to fill out an employer form. Uh, Sophie's asking if they have um EH, ECHP, which is one that we just talked about, do they still have to pass functional skills to go into endpoint assessment? Emma, I have a feeling that's a yes, but I'm just gonna yeah. pass it. Yeah, so they, they do still need to, to pass the functional skills. Yeah, yeah and that might be when we will look at um, additional support plans and things like that, that we that we yeah. have a lot of support for, for everyone sort of yeah. things. We would access uh, arrangements and so on, yeah. yeah. Um, so Nicolette's just asking, this new standard, will the diploma now is across the board for our apprenticeship providers? Yes. So from April 2024, no apprenticeship provider will will be offering the early years level three with a, with a diploma. So this new standard across the whole board. So it's for the program, not the provider. Um, and Sophie, at level two, they would still have to do skills level one if they're doing an early years practitioner um, apprenticeship, it's level one. Amazing. Just check if anybody else has any questions. Um, Still level two on a level three apprenticeship. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you want, Sophia, I'll I'll make I'll get I'll get confirmation from Tracy or the apprenticeship team, and I will I will email you just to make sure that I've I've got that information correct. Um, Yes, that's how I. That's what I'm. I'm. I'm aware of. But at the end of the day, if it is different, then we'll we'll make sure that we're aware of of the of the levels needed for that one. Amazing. Um, and also just a a little um a note as well on National Pinship Week. We do have another webinar that's going ahead on Wednesday that hopefully will be really insightful for the early years, like. Uh, industry so we've got so we're basically calling it um solving the early years recruitment crisis um, and it's going to be about challenges and solutions so we've got expert speakers from the industry we've got in in family club kids planet uh, early years alliance and um from the a local local authority council and we're just opening up to have a really a wide discussion about the recruitment crisis what's working what's not and how we see um, how we see it going for 2025. So I, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Um, in the email that I send out, I'll put a little registration link in there as well so you can register for that one. But it's all on our National Apprenticeship Week website as well if you want to sign up for any of the other um, webinars that are happening this week. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming along today. Hopefully we've, we've answered all your questions um, and you've got a little bit more information on the programme. Um, well, this is a good question. Sorry for jumping in if anybody's still here. So um, Jacqueline's asking, if an un unqualified practitioner starts the apprenticeship, are they included in the ratio? 
Um, do they? Uh, so if they start the level three, are they included when they're on program or after they finish the the program? So they can within the um the newer EYFS requirements. Um, they can be counted. So let's say they're on the early years educator apprenticeship, for example, they can be counted for um fully qualified for the the level um below if deemed competent. So they can be counted as a level two practitioner in ratio. Yeah. So that means if they've got the level two already, they would be counted as a level three whilst doing the level three. So so they can be so they can be counted as a a level okay. two practitioner if they've if they've not achieved anything yet they can be counted as if they're deemed as competent they can be counted as as the level below their current level of study yeah fab thank you oh sophie's looked up i will get in i will still get in touch with you sophie and just make sure um from our side that that's what we do um perfect Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming, everyone. Um, that's that's us for now, but um, I'll be in touch with more information on everything we've talked about and with these slides and the questions. Um, but thank you. I hope you have a lovely rest of the day and enjoy National Friendship Week. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.